Hello dear friends, and here we meet again after uh, a long time, relatively long time, we did it since the last lecture, but I promise you that uh, we will end this topic of applied neural anatomy very soon in the coming few weeks. Uh, today's topic is about the anatomy of the internal capsule. What is interesting about the internal capsule is that it is a good chance to revise many of the connections in this region and the tractology of the region where most of the fibers are passing through uh, the internal capsule. The internal capsule is a white matter structure, as you all know, in the inframedial part of each cerebral hemisphere. So each cerebral hemisphere has the medial part of the cerebral hemisphere. The lower part of the inferior cere cerebral hemisphere carries the internal capsule and of course as you all know it is present between the thalamus and head of the caudate nucleus medially thalamus posterior and head of the caudate anterior both are medial and the lentiform nucleus laterally and it is composed of myelinated fibers of ascending and descending tracts what we call the projection fibers going uh, uh, up to and down from the cerebral cortex and it is composed of five parts the anterior limb the genou the posterior limb the retrolenticular part and the sublenticular part and of course the fibers uh, going to the cortex or coming from the cortex after leaving the internal capsule they radiate and they disperse and they reach different parts of the cerebral hemispheres, forming the corona radiata. It's like a crown, radiating crown. So the fibers are compact. They are uh, compressed in the internal capsule. When uh, the fibers go to the internal capsule or leave the internal capsule, they disperse to reach different parts of the cerebral cortex, forming the corona radiata. This is, of course, the internal capsule. And as we said, medially and until we have the head of the caudate, medially posterior, we have the thalamus. And laterally, we have the lentiform nucleus, which is formed of the putamen and globus pallidus. Another view showing the head of the caudate, thalamus medially, lentiform nucleus laterally, anterior limb, genou, posterior limb of the internal capsule and the retroanticular part and the sublenticular part behind and below the lentiform nucleus are not seen here and as you all know in the cross section horizontal section you get the sylvian fissure you get the insula here then after that you get what we call the extreme capsule then the colostrum then the external capsule then the lentiform nucleus composed of two parts, the putamen and globus pallidus, and then the internal capsule and the medial boundary anteriorly, caudate, posteriorly, thalamus. Coronal section, same thing, caudate nucleus, lentiform nucleus, internal capsule. Uh, as we said here, uh, as you see it, it is a V-shaped structure. Anterior limb, genou, and posterior limb is a V-shaped structure and there are two more parts behind the lentiform and below the lentiform that are not seen here. This is another view where you can see the parts we didn't see in the first few diagrams. As we said here, again, thalamus, caudate, anterior limb, genou, posterior limb, and the retro lenticular part. It is behind the lentiform nucleus from the lateral geniculate body responsible for vision to the uh, what we call the uh, uh, projection or irradiation fibers from the lateral geniculate body to the occipital cortex area 17 and the sublenticular is below the uh, lentiform nucleus so that we cannot see it here while doing with the, the dashed line and taking place from the medial geniculate body to the uh, auditory area in the uh, temporal lobe 
in the superior temporal gyrus, Hassel's gyrus, area 41 or 42, as we'll see. So again, anterior limb, genou, posterior limb, subventricular part, retroventricular part. The anterior limb of the internal capsule, it lies, as we said, between the head of the caudate medially and the lentiform nucleus laterally. So this is the anterior limb. And the anterior limb contains uh, what we call the anterior thalamic afferents. The anterior thalamic afferent, which are forming uh, part of the circle of papes, which is going from the anterior nucleus of the thalamus to the prefrontal region as we can remind you now, now we'll see it and you'll remember everything. So there are fibers going from the anterior nucleus of the thalamus to the prefrontal region, circle of papes, and there are also fibers, what we call the anterior and lateral ventral nuclei, which are going from the thalamus to the prefrontal region also, and they are the afferent of the dentato rubro thalamo fronto ponto cerebellar pathway or dentato thalamo directly dentato rubro thalamo or dentato thalamo so the afferent fibers of this very famous uh, circuit between the cerebellum and the brain is uh, present here when we say the dentato rubro thalamo thalamo fronto going from the anterior and lateral ventral nucleus of thalamus to the prefrontal region. Thalamofronto, they pass through the internal capsule, so they are afferent fibers present in the anterior limb of the internal capsule, and it also contains the efferent of the same pathway. As we said, thalamo, intato, rubro, thalamo, fronto, ponto. How can it reach from the prefrontal region to the pons? Through the internal capsule, through the anterior limb of the internal capsule. So what we have here in the anterior limb of the internal capsule are the afferent and the efferent of the dentato rubro thalamo fronto ponto cerebellar pathway. The afferent going to the uh, from the anterior and lateral ventral nuclei, they go uh, to the prefrontal region, and fibers from the prefrontal region they go to the pontine nuclei and cerebellum afferent and if so anterior thalamic afferent part of the circle of papes from the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and the afferent of the from the anterior and lateral ventral nuclei of the thalamus going to the prefrontal region and this is the efferent and abnormalities of the anterior limb uh, you see it atrophic you see it small in the cases of schizophrenia bipolar and obsessive compulsive neurosis. Why? Because they are forming a part of the uh, uh, psychogenic circle, circle for the uh, responsible for the uh, emotions, and uh, that's why disturbance of um, presence of these diseases would result in atrophy, some atrophy of the anterior limb of the internal capsule. So let's see. This is the circle of Papes. If you remember, we have, we start by gyrus, cingulate gyrus, then a deep structure, cingulum. The cingulum goes to another gyrus, cortical gyrus, parahippocampal region, to the hippocampus. So, cingulate gyrus, cingulum. Parahippocampal gyrus, hippocampus. And then the fornix, the femoral fornix, mammillary body, the mammillary body, mammillothalamic tracts, to the anterior thalamic nuclei, and from the anterior thalamic nuclei to the cingulate gyrus through the anterior limb of the internal capsule, what we call the anterior thalamic fibers. So this is uh, one of the contents of the anterior limb of the internal capsule. And the other contents of the internal capsule are the efferent and the afferent of the dentato rubro thalamo fronto ponto cerebellar pathway. You see here the dentate nucleus and crossing to the other side. 
to the red nucleus of the other side, dentato, rubro, then uh, to the lateral and anterior lateral ventral and anterior ventral nuclei of the thalamus, then from the thalamus, thalamo fronto, thalamo fronto, this is present in the anterior limb of the internal capsule, and the fronto ponto to the pontine nuclei is present also in the anterior limb of the internal capsule and from the pontine fibers it goes to the cerebral cortex from the cerebellar cortex sorry and goes from the cerebellar cortex again to the dentate you see here a crossing from the dentate to the red nucleus of the other side and you see another crossing from the pontine nuclei to the cerebellar cortex actually the pontine nuclei are not real nuclei as we said but they are the part of the pyramidal tract which are divided into uh, uh, different clusters, the what we call the corticospinal, medial, and lateral corticobulbar, and gives the, the appearance of nuclei. But they are actually the tracts, the pyramidal tracts in the region of the pons. So again, we said that the uh, circle of papes, anterior limb, thalamo, Singlet gyrus, anterior thalamic nuclei to the singlet gyrus. Others, other afferents in the anterior limb is the dentate from the dentate nucleus to the frontal and the efferent from the frontal to the uh, pontine nuclei. So, if we look to the anterior limb of the internal capsule, we see that we have the frontopontine fibers going from the frontal, prefrontal region to the pontine nuclei in the pons, passing in the anterior limb, and in the middle we have the anterior thalamic radiation. Anterior thalamic radiation from the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, part of the circle of papes to the cingulum, and also from the lateral and anterior ventral nuclei of the thalamus to the, uh, uh, the prefrontal region also. So, these, the efferents of the dentate rubothalamo, the efferent of the dentate rubothalamo, and the efferent from the anterior thalamic nucleus, circle of papes. These are the contents of the anterior limb of the internal capsule. Again, as this is a diagram showing that it contains the anterior thalamic radiation carrying sensation and the frontopontine, frontoponto cerebellar pathway and also the anterior thalamic radiation uh, from the anterior thalamic nuclei and from the lateral and ventral thalamic nuclei part of the dentatorubothalamo and this is the frontopontine fibers. Again, central part anterior thalamic radiation laterally the frontopontine fibers. Again, medial part, anterior thalamic radiation, and the lateral is the efferent from the prefrontal region, frontopontine fibers. And the genou, second part, uh, contains the corticonuclear cells, tracts, corticonuclear tracts or corticobulbar tracts. They go from the pyramidal cortex to the cranial nerve nuclei of the opposite side of the brainstem. So, as we have the upper motor control of the anterior horn cells is corticospinal tracts. Uh, the upper motor control of the uh, motor nuclei in the brainstem are called corticonuclear or corticobulbar tracts, and they pass in the genou, and the fibers pass through the ipsilateral after passing from the internal capsule. They are efferent fibers uh, going from the uh, cortex down to these nuclei passing in the cerebral peduncle of the midbrain and anterior midbrain, if you remember the interpeduncular fossa, cerebral peduncles, then there is a decassation and ending in the motor nuclei of the cranial nerves of the opposite side, mainly. But some of the fibers pass to the same side and so the corticobulbar fibers go to the nuclei of the lower cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and the tongue of both sides, of both sides. 
And this is very important. This is from God's mercy that hemiplegic patients do not have bulbar symptoms or tongue paralysis. Any patient with hemiplegia, wherever the, the, the site of the hemiplegia, cortical or subcortical, you find him capable of swallowing, capable of eating, cap not choking, capable of drinking. And this is a very important sign. And uh, these uh, fibers, as we said, upper motor control of the motor nuclei of the lower cranial nerves and the tongue, which are present in the medulla, uh, are passing through the genou of the internal capsule and bilateral internal capsule infarction. Sometimes the patient has double stroke, one right and one left. The result is what we call the pseudo bulbar palsy. In neurology, you will see it. You see that there is no, uh, there is, uh, here he develops uh, all the bulbar symptoms, but they are not true bulbar because the, the you find that the arch of the palate and the pharyngeal arch, they are uh, high tone inside them, but the patient is not capable of uh, uh, swallowing exactly as the true bulbar palsy, uh, where the defect is in the motor nucleus. Here the defect is in the upper motor control of the nucleus, but it has to be bilateral. So again, the genou carrying corticonuclear fibers or corticobulbar fibers because it is the upper motor control of the bulbar nuclei and the tongue. And here again, we have the genou, the corticobulbar fibers. Another corticonuclear for the head and neck, which are responsible for swallowing. You know that uh, if you have uh, a bulbar palsy, you have, uh, you are choking, you having uh, uh, dysphonia, not capable of talking, you have hoarseness of voice, and you have in a uh, water uh, regurge from the nose, if you know the bulbar symptoms, uh, and you get a nasal tone or nasal regurge, you get choking and hoarseness of voice. So, uh, for for injury on one side nothing happens bilaterally presented but injury of both sides result in a disaster now we pass to the posterior limb of the internal capsule and as we said it contains the anterior two-thirds and the posterior third the anterior two-thirds contain the corticospinal fibers you are all waiting for these fibers because as you all know, if you have an infarction or hemorrhage in the inner capsule, you get contralateral weakness. Why? Because there is injury of the corticospinal fibers, which are passing in the anterior two thirds of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And as you know, it is going from the pyramidal area, pyramidal fibers from the motor area, eight, down to the uh, anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. So this is the pyramidal fibers passing in the anterior two thirds of uh, the, the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And it contains also fibers from the dentate nucleus to the lateral ventral nucleus of the thalamus and to the frontal. Remember when we said dentato, dentato, Rubro thalam. Uh, in the anterior limb, we said that the thalamofrontal passes in the anterior limb. So, what about the dentato thalamo? The dentato thalamo, dentato rubro thalamo, fronto ponto cerebellar pathway, dentato thalamo passes in the anterior two thirds of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So, it's very easy. The dentate nucleus has to reach the thalamus. These fibers, afferent fibers from the dentate pass in the anterior two thirds of the internal capsule. And as we said, we have, remember the fronto ponto cerebellar pathway, the fronto ponto, we said it passes in the anterior limb. 
most of the fibrous parts in the anterior limb, but some of the fibrous parts in the posterior limb, not only the frontal ponto, but there is temporal ponto, parietal ponto, and occipital ponto cerebellar pathway. So we have the frontal ponto and we have the temporal parietal occipital cerebellar pathway. What is the function of these fibers? Actually, it is not really known, but definitely as there are fibers passing from the prefrontal region to the pontine nuclei, some, most of them pass in the anterior limb, some of them pass in the anterior two-thirds of the posterior limb, together with fibers from the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe to the cerebellum. And also it contains in the posterior third, we're talking about the anterior two-thirds, we'll, we'll talk about it now, posterior third is carrying what? It is carrying sensation. So the anterior two-thirds of the posterior limb are involved with motor, whether fibers coming from the cortex to the anterior horn cells, whether fibers coming from the dentate nucleus to the lateral ventral nucleus of the thalamus to the frontal region uh, for the uh, cerebro cerebellar connection, it's also motor, and the frontal, ponto, and temporal parietal occipital cerebellar pathway, they are more uh, different fibers. Posterior third contains sensation, what we call the superior thalamic radiation. In the anterior limb, we, it was called the anterior thalamic radiation, but here, superior thalamic radiation is responsible for all types of sensation. As you remember in the thalamus, and we'll see it now, that the thalamus is the secretary of the brain. Not a single sensation is allowed to reach the sensory area 312, not passing through the thalamus. So I am a superficial sensation. I am a deep sensation. I want to reach the boss, which is the sensory area 312, post central gyrus. No, I am not allowed. I have to meet the secretary first, which is the thalamus, if you remember. So it receives the posterior third of the, the posterior third of the posterior limb of the internal capsule receives all types of sensation, superficial or deep, passing from the thalamus to the brain. So the superficial sensation, if you remember, received from the spinal limniscus, the lateral ventral spinal thalamic tracts forming spinal limniscus, and from the thalamus, they go to sensory area 312 in the posterior third of the posterior limb. Also, the deep sensation, if you remember, received in the thalamus from the medial limniscus, sense of position, sense of passive movement, sense of vibration, muscle sense, joint sense, medial limniscus, and then to the sensory area 312. If you remember, region of the pulvinar responsible for this. So the posterior limb of the internal capsule has got anterior two-thirds forming the very famous corticospinal fibers, or the pyramidal tracts, and it contains the efferents from the dentate nucleus to the lateral ventral nucleus of the thalamus, part of the dentato rubro thalamo. So we have dentato thalamo or dentato rubro thalamo passing through the posterior, anterior two thirds of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. The thalamo frontal is passing through the anterior limb. Okay. The frontal ponto, most of them passing through the anterior limb, but here some frontal ponto cerebellar fibers are present together with the others. We'll see. So we talked about the anterior limb, we talked about the genou, now we're talking about the posterior limb. And the posterior limb, as we said, is containing anterior two thirds and posterior third here for sake of simplicity. They're showing here in red. Uh, the cortico, maybe the maybe this one, corticospinal fibers, and the corticospinal fibers, and this is the uh, pyramid, the yellow here, and we have here the 
efferent from the thalamus, the posterior third receiving sensation and getting it to the uh, getting it to the sensory area 312. As we said, this is the secretary. Uh, if you have many things and many tasks to do, not all the tasks are allowed to reach the boss. It has to be filtrated. And what is important, meeting the boss. So the deep sensation and the superficial sensation has to stop first at the secretary before going to the boss. And the pathway to the boss is through the posterior third of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Again, uh, it's not that important. You can further subdivide the corticospinal fibers into head, neck, and lower limb. Trunk, head, neck, trunk, and lower limb. As we said, again, the dentato, rubro, going to the red nucleus. This is from the cerebellum. No, here, so I'm sorry. Dentato, rubro, thalamo, or dentato, thalamo. Then it goes through the uh, internal capsule to reach the cerebral cortex, as we said. And we talk now about the retroventricular part and the sublenticular part. The retroventricular part is present around the posterior edge of the lentiform nucleus, it is behind the lentiform nucleus, it is retro-lenticular. And, of course, it contains the optic radiation passing from the lateral geniculate body to the calcarine fissure where the visual area is present, area 17. So, we call the genicolo-calcarine fibers. Genicolo-calcarine fibers pass in the part of the internal capsule behind the lentiform nucleus called the retrolenticular part. And if you remember the optic nerve, optic tract, optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, and going to the lateral geniculate body and the optic radiation, optic radiation passes behind the uh, lentiform nucleus to go behind to reach the occipital lobe. So it is reaching the lobe behind, which is the occipital. So it is logic that you have it the fibers behind the lentiform, the retro-lenticular part, from the lateral geniculate body to the visual cortex. Another view uh, from the lateral geniculate body, lateral geniculate body, the optic radiation reaching the occipital loop behind the internal capsule. Again, lateral geniculate body, optic radiation to the visual cortex. And another lateral geniculate body, optic tract, lateral geniculate body, retrolenticular part of the internal capsule, and optic radiation, and then the visual cortex. The sublenticular part is below the lentiform nucleus, and it carries auditory radiation from the medial geniculate body to Hassel's gyrus area 41, 42, in the middle of the superior temporal gyrus. If you remember, the auditory area, as we said before, auditory area in the middle of the superior temporal gyrus of the dominant hemisphere. Both sides, but left side is dominant, but it's both sides. So this is the sublenticular part from the medial geniculate body, dashed line because you don't see it, because it is below the lentiform nucleus and going on its way to the temporal loop. And this is the pathway of hearing. Not, Of course, I'm not going to prove all the details. If you remember from the cochlea and from the cochlear nuclei, and there is the trapezoid body, superior olivary nucleus, and forming the lateral limniscus inferior colliculus, medial geniculate body, and the, from the medial geniculate body to the uh, auditory area of the cortex, Hassel's gyrus, through the retroventricular part of the internal capsule. One thing to be said in hearing, superior olivary nucleus, the function, 
if you remember, is responsible for localization of the sound. You have the intensity, you have uh, uh, the frequency, and you have localization. And it has a very nice reflex. Uh, when you localize from where is the sound, reflexly, you run on the opposite side. This is very important in animals. If you have a deer uh, at night and in a forest, and it hears a sound from one side, it immediately runs to the opposite side, away from the sound, by the superior livery nucleus. It's not our issue, but it was something nice to see. And here, again, dear friends, fear colliculus, medial geniculate body, and retroventricular part. Uh, this is more detailed from the medial geniculate body and going to the auditory area 41-42. And another view, lateral ventricular part. The blood supply of the internal capsule, it is supplied by perforators. Uh, of course, you know that it is lateral, not a midline structure, the internal capsule. So it receives branches from the anterior cerebral, from the middle cerebral, posterior cerebral, from all the cerebral arteries, as well as the anterior choroidal branch of the internal carotid. Of course, the anterior part of the internal capsule is supplied by branches from the anterior cerebral artery and from the middle cerebral artery and the posterior part or middle part from the anterior choroidal artery and posterior part from the posterior cerebral artery. It's not that important, but you should know that perforators from all these arteries, anterior, middle, anterior choroidal, posterior cerebral, share in supplying the internal capsule and any injury of these perforators, especially in aneurysm surgery, you can result in hemiplegia because you are uh, affecting the blood supply. Clinical significance, uh, internal capsule is a very common site for infarctions and hemorrhage because it is supplied by branches of the lenticulostriate arteries, uh, as we will give you in the anatomy of the perforators. Uh, the medial lenticulostriate arteries from the anterior cerebral, lateral lenticulostriate arteries, especially the lateral lenticulostriate from the middle cerebral, are liable to, in chronic hypertension, to rupture, causing cerebral hemorrhage, or it causes uh, narrowing and uh, thrombosis of the uh, perforator on top of atherosclerosis resulting in lacunar infarction, small infarction, uh, five millimeters, six millimeters, one centimeter. But it is, as we said, the fibers are compact in the internal capsule, so it can result in contralateral hemiplegia. So the clinical significance, internal capsule, it is a common site for infarctions, lacunar infarctions, and hemorrhage. And also the internal capsule is liable to injury while operating on deeply seated tumors like gliomas, together with the corona radiata. If you go in the subcortical region, you get injury of the fibers uh, going to or coming from the internal capsule at the subcortical level. At the cortical level, uh, which causes the weakness, which causes the problems because at the, 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 the cortical level, the cerebral cortex is very rich in blood supply. So actually, it is not the cause of the hemiplegia we get when you operate on deeply seated gliomas, when you operate on uh, 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 intraaxial tumors, because uh, it can regenerate, because you have the supplementary motor area, can regenerate very rapidly. But what, what refrains uh, uh, improvement after injury with the injury of the subcortical region, whether the corona radiata or the internal capsule, having poor blood supply, so they do not regenerate. And also another clinical importance is the genou of the internal capsule can be injured uh, while operating on interventricular tumors because the genou is lateral to the foramen of Monroe. The genou is lateral to the foramen of Monroe. Sometimes you work on a glioma interventricular and you are excising it and you get some 
patient with him, he please said, I didn't touch anything. I was just walking on the surface of the, on the lateral wall of the lateral ventricle. But actually at the level of the foramen of Monroe, the fibers of the internal capsule are very close here and you might injure the genou, you might injure the uh, anterior two thirds of the posterior limb and you might get hemiplegia while operating intraventricular. This is to show you an infarction in different stages and different uh, uh, modes of MRI and it is affecting the internal capsule. Here is the thalamus, here is the lentiform nucleus, here it is affecting the anterior two-thirds of the posterior limb, very common site for infarctions resulting in hemiplegia and aphasia. Hemiplegia and aphasia. Of course, the corticobulbar might be affected. And this is hemorrhage, very famous perforator from the lenticulostriate group lateral of the internal of the middle cerebral artery called uh, Charcot's artery. It's a French uh, anatomist. It's called uh, uh, L'artère de Charcot pour l'hémorragie cérébrale. Charcot's artery for the cerebral hemorrhage. Very common site for injury. And again, in this view, you can see how close is the genou to the foramen of Monroe. So if this is the foramen of Monroe and lateral to the foramen of Monroe is, you see, it's very close. When you go posteriorly, uh, you have the thalamus between it and the internal capsule. When you go anteriorly, you have the caudate nucleus between it and the internal capsule. But in this region, there is nothing between the foramen of Monroe and the internal capsule. You can injure directly the genou or the anterior, uh, anterior part of the posterior limb or the blood supply and you can result in hemiplegia. Thank you very much for your attention. And as I said, I promise you that I will give you very frequent uh, lectures uh, so that we can end or finish uh, the applied neuroanatomy as, uh, as fast as we can, I hope, because it is a very big branch, but uh, actually what is left is not like what we passed through. And uh, thank you for your faithful uh, presence and uh, again any comments anything to ask about I'll be more than happy to receive from you and hope to see you soon uh, all in good health and good shape inshallah thank you very much